So our first speaker today is Reed Sanchez, and he joins Dr. Heron's group with a background in mechanical engineering from Colorado School of Mines. His experience and education in both mechanical and electrical engineering contributes a multidimensional understanding of both sides of the machines to their team. When he isn't thinking about all things engineering, Reed enjoys problem solving, running, spending quality time with friends, and participating in Bible study. Okay, I guess that's me. Um, so we're here to talk today about something that we don't usually talk about, which is mechanical things. Um, so today I'm going to talk about, discuss a mechanical validation of a high power density external cantilevered rotor. So really, we did a test of a really cool machine. Um, so the goal of this rotor um, is NASA wants to help provide electric powered flight. And this is one of the steps that we are taking in order to do that. So quick outline of this, of this talk. First, I'm going to talk about the machine design in, in its entirety. Um, then about ex two specific mechanical challenges that we have. First being the expansion due to, the, due to the high speed and the rotor dynamics. Finally, there'll be a little bit about the test setup, the test results, and conclusion. This, by the way, is our full-size prototype. Um, it's about it's uh, 13 inches by 14 inches, so 13 inch diameter. So, um, so this is again our design, uh, and there's two portions. So on the rotating side, um, that's all of this. Uh, that was probably very unclear. Okay, the titanium shell is in charge of coupling with the outside world, the rotating part coupling with the outside world structural stability, thermal management, and ease of, uh, of assembly. What we mean by cantilevered is the fact that this, the, this outer section is held on by this base plate. So everything is held um, by one end. That's what we mean by cantilevered. Um, and external, rotator, uh, external rotor, that's this outside portion, is the portion that rotates. Um, uh, the other portions of the design are this uh, carbon fiber ring, and this carbon fiber ring and the titanium shell combine to be able to uh, retain these magnets. Uh, the reason that this is so crucial is magnets are brittle. If you have these brittle magnets um, uh, without any kind of retention mechanism, then they are they easily break. Uh, so, and we don't want that because bad things happen. Um, uh, oh, the stationary side includes the uh, high, the air gap wound lits, uh, high frequency lits wires. Those are these wires right here. Uh, there's also a high performance uh, ferrite back yoke. That's this, and then an aluminum heat sink. That is this. Also, there is a, a different type of aluminum. This is our our fixture. This is in charge of holding the bearings as well as um, really creating the stationary frame which the, which the rotating frame is based off of. Um, uh, finally, there is a bearing system. That's these two bearings as you can see. And then back here there's, a, there's also a wave spring uh, that you can't see. And these, this system is what allows the rotor to spin. Um, uh, also on the physical features, um, back here is a fan. This is another picture of the fan which kind of gives you a better idea of what it looks like. As you can see, it's a centrifugal fan. It pulls air from the back and it expels the air out of the, of the holes. Um, there is, these are the, these are the magnets. This is a balancing ring. This is what we are using to help balance the machine. Um, so fan magnets. This is the lock nut. This is what holds the whole uh, structure together. Uh, and as you can see again, the titanium shell and the carbon fiber ring. Okay. Um, a little bit about the key metrics of this. Um, first is this one megawatt. Uh, NASA desires one megawatt of power for their, uh, for their program. Uh, this will enable uh, larger electric powered aircraft. Um, the efficiency, NASA desires a 96% efficient 
uh, machine. We are above that. The reason we're above is we actually need this efficiency in order to be able to get the heat out. That's actually more of an issue than the efficiency itself. Um, uh, specific power, NASA desires a specific power of um, 13 kilowatts per kilogram. Currently we have some margin on that. Uh, total machine weight, 144 pounds, which is pretty light for a megawatt. Um, installation class H, that means we can get up to, I think it's a 180 degrees Celsius, um, but don't quote me on that. Uh, it's essentially the highest insulation class uh, that we can get to with a reasonable fill factor of copper. Um, and then uh, I want to talk a little bit about um, the, these tip speeds. So in order to create this high power density, which is our goal, what we do, so high power density is, as you can see here, it's a power divided by a weight. So in order to increase power density, you increase the power and you decrease the weight. Um, and so in order to decrease the iron, so in order to decrease the weight, we decrease the iron. And we do that by increasing the frequency, which allows us to decrease the amount of iron that we need to carry our magnetic uh, field. And we do that by increasing our, high, increasing our speed and increasing our number of poles. Um, that is on the stationary side. On the rotating side, we do that by going to a haulback array, which takes away a need for any back iron on the rotating side. So all of this to say, we've made some specific design choices in order to make our machine lighter. Um, in terms of increasing the power, uh, our very own Andy Yoon has done some uh, optimization in order to get the most power that we can from this configuration. Um, okay, so that is our first section. This is the, um, that, well, that was the, the, a little bit about the design summary. Okay, the first thing that we're going to talk about is expansion due to the high speed. So as this is spinning, the, there's a centrifugal force and that makes the whole, this whole center, this whole outer ring expand outwards. As, and so this is it not expanded at all, this is it expanding outwards. Um, so um, there, we care about this for two reasons. Reason one, as our rotor expands, we increase our magnetic air gap. As our air gap increases, our magnetic reluctance also increases. Think uh, resistance. Magnetic reluctance and resistance are corollary. Um, this decreases our B field, and this lowers our Lorenz force. So essentially, as our, as our air gap increases, the amount of power that we get decreases. Uh, the second reason is based on Hooke's law. Essentially, as something uh, elongates, there is a greater stress that um, occurs within the part itself. Um, so some of the some of the variables that have to do with this is uh, the tip speed nu, that's that V uh, symbol up there, uh, rho, the average density of the components underneath the radial in the radial dimension. Uh, the inner radius of the retaining ring, that's this carbon fiber retaining ring here. Uh, the thickness of the, um, the inner radius of the retaining ring, the thickness of the retaining ring, the Young's modulus of the carbon fiber, and the thickness of the titanium shell and magnets, essentially the things that are underneath this retaining ring. And all these combine to give us an approximation of how we are expecting this to expand. Um, uh, so the first things first, so air gap, so essentially as our air gap increases, as it expands, we expect the power level to drop, right? So according to our calculations, as we ex are expanding, um, as, our, as it changes from 0 0.4 to 0 point, um, you know, 5 something, so this is a little bit more than a millimeter, we are expecting our um, machine power to decrease about 2%. We can take this into account for our motor design. Uh, we can do that. Um, uh, the second part is 
uh, the stresses. Essentially, as it expands, there, there are these stresses which are caused by the force. These stresses can cause catastrophic, 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 my bad, thank you, um, catastrophic failure, right? We don't want that to happen. So, um, so a quick thing about the safety factors, uh, I'm only going to look at two parts right here. Uh, these are the two structural parts. First is the carbon fiber ring. Our safety factor is over 15. This means it ain't going to break. Um, the next one that we're going to talk about is this titanium shell. Um, really what we're seeing is because the, uh, because the air holes, which we need in order to um, expel the air out of, we need some kind of a hole. And this hole is what we call a stress uh, concentration factor. And we're seeing that because of the stress concentration factor, we're getting a safety factor just under two. This is very survivable. And in fact, we did survive it. So it all works. Um, OK. So that was the expansion. Now we're going to talk a little bit about rotor dynamics. So what rotor dynamics is, is it's the study of the vibration of rotating objects. It's the study of the vibration of rotating objects. So essentially, as you spin anything, as you move anything, it, uh, you're creating some kind of, of forcing frequency. Everything has a frequency at which it wants to move. So think about a swing, right? As you, as, if, you're, if you've been on a swing, you know that as you pump your legs at a certain frequency, you can increase how high you get on that swing. That is called the resonant frequency. That is these lines right here. Right? Those are the resonant frequencies. And then there's the synchronous frequency. This is, the, this is what we are forcing our uh, machine at. So this is, the, this is the synchronous line. This is the one per rev. And this is the electrical frequency. Right? So this is 10 times that one per rev. Um, so there is an issue. Right? We're going along and we run into this, this, we're running our synchronous frequency right into this natural frequency. Uh, the, the reason that, we, that we're okay with this is because, because, the, because the slope, this is a backward whirling mode. And in general, these do not get excited, in general. So uh, this is something to be aware of, but in general, these do not get excited. Um, Oh, the other thing is, uh, at our rated speed, we, are, we have a margin of greater than 10%, which is typical of industry. Um, so then, let's go make sure our calculations uh, match reality. So this is our test setup. So first things first, safety. So this is the, um, this is the spin pit. So these are lead bricks. This is all encased in a metal uh, shell. And then around that was a concrete wall. The, if, it, if anything exploded, it wasn't going anywhere. Um, then we have our test rotor, which is going to go into our spin pit. This is the lid that we're using to keep everything nice and contained. Um, and then that up there, that's the air turbine. The air turbine's goal is to spin the rotor at the correct speed. One thing to note is we did not use actual magnets in this. We used a stainless steel that had the same density. We did this for a couple reasons. One, magnets are expensive. Two, if we have uh, a magnetic uh, material that then explodes, picking up 20 zillion pieces of magnetic dust is really difficult. Um, so that's the test setup. Uh, another thing that we did is we measured the expansion. Uh, we measured the expansion down here. This was our fixture in order to be able to measure that expansion. Um, OK. Uh, so here we are. These are the results. So as you can see, um, the blue is our theoretical. This is what we got from our, um, from our finite element models. And the green was what we measured. Right, and as we can see, we're getting a pretty good correlation. Uh, there's some things that we can still do that we're still working on to get a better correlation, but it's pretty good right here. We did simulate the magnets in glue as one unit, so we didn't 
in this simulation, the one with this blue line, it is, isn't like magnet glue, magnet glue. It's all one unit. So that is one um, thing that we can increase our fidelity on. Uh, and the other part is uh, the rotor dynamics. So as you saw, we didn't have the same rotor dynamic system. So what we did is rather than keeping the same, rather than trying to make this make it, which is going to happen in the future, make the same system, we did a rotor dynamic map of this system. Um, as you can see, it looks a lot different. Um, but what we the the important part is we are seeing that at these points we are we are seeing the frequencies that we would want to be seeing. So here, this is, a th this is the run up, and this is the run back. So that's, you know, correspond to that backward and forward whirling mode. Because this is a pendulum mode, we are exciting them. Um, so those correspond to this line and this line, or this hump and this hump. And then it's kind of difficult to see, but that little guy right there, that is this guy right here. And up here, where we really care about it, where it has a lot more energy, um, we're seeing a uh, percent error of 3%. So what this indicates to me is that our um, models are pretty good at, at predicting where we're going to be seeing these frequencies. And that's really what our goal is for this test. OK. So in conclusion. Uh, we've talked about two of the major mechanical issues that come about when designing electric machines, mainly uh, uh, when designing this specific electric machine, namely the expansion due to rotor dynamics, uh, the expansion due to the high speed, and the rotor dynamics. Uh, future work includes verifying these rotor dynamics w w against our bearings, and then also um, one major risk that we have is the windage loss. So essentially, how much energy do we lose to air friction? Um, yeah, so that's future work. That's uh, what has been covered. Uh, thank you for your time. If there's any questions, I'd love to know. Yes. Yes. So that is this. So I had a wrong um, material in here is what was going on. I, I, was, I was thinking I was being too optimistic as to what, um, what was calculated versus measured, right? So my, my um, Young's modulus. I was using as more of a stainless steel rather than a better approximation being the stainless steel and the glue in a transverse um, composite. So essentially, it was my my bad. Give me one second. And there was a. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So I should be having lesser torque from the motor? Yes. So for this kind of application, if I understand correctly, it's like a quadratic load torque speed characteristic. So this is for propulsion like a fan speed. Uh, there's two things going on, right? So this, especially our test, did not have, was in a vacuum. So I'm asking like the end of the object. Yes, like yes. Yes. So that do we need to over design for that conditions to make sure that that even under expansion condition I have enough torque generated? Yes. Okay. So in that case, why don't you put it inside and then if it expands my gap decreases and I can have higher torque at the high point? So there's a couple reasons for that. Uh we'll go here. Um so as, that's a great thought. The thing is, as this increases, right, um, th this increases and the stress is taken by the carbon fiber. If we were to flip this, right, so if this is now on the inside, then our air gap now includes the titanium shell 
and the carbon fiber. So our air gap has gone from being just the Litz windings and um, the magnets, really just the Litz windings, to the Litz windings, the titanium shell, and the carbon fiber. Right? So our air gap would grow a lot. So that's the main reason why we ha are having this outer rotor. What do you mean? So, in general, if it was inside, it would be like supported by two buildings. Mm -hmm. Now, you have a cantilever structure. Does that create any problem in like rotor dynamics or anything? I mean, that's why we've done this. Okay. Right? So, because, because we're seeing, hey, this is, this is a new, this is an issue. There could be issues here. Right? So, that's why we did and are going to continue to do rotor dynamic physical tests. Yeah. So you're exactly right. That is an issue. That's why we're doing these tests. Okay. So so what we did, right, is so the the way that they wrapped it is they wrapped it in a really specific way, and they know exactly how they wrapped it, right? And they know what, the, what that dimension is. So we can actually take, okay, we went, it, the numbers are we did 40 wraps in this direction, the hoop direction, and then we did uh, really it was 10 in the hoop direction, and then two at the 45 degree direction, and then another 10 in the hoop direction, and then... Um, it was two at the 20 degree direction. And then, and so what you can do is you can actually take this, uh, now you have this information of what all the directions are that go into this. You have, we have that information, I have that information. And because I have that, I can actually take that and make it into, again, a composite, um, this time, uh, longitudinal, um, uh, Young's modulus, right? So you're essentially taking that Young's modulus and you're taking and you're making it into a into a uh, longitudinal Young's modulus. You're saying in this direction, this is what it does. And then you also, when we we're, when we're modeling this, we have to also be careful to to model it differently in the different directions, right? So in the hoop direction, we have a certain Young's modulus because that's what it is. Right? In this direction, it's a lot stronger than it is in this direction. So we, we were very specific to model this um, in the hoop direction differently than we were in the longitudinal direction. Yeah. Yeah. I might have missed this. Uh, these frequencies or these frequencies? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so kind of yes. Um, the orientation of the motor will will define your bearing stiffnesses. Your bearing stiffnesses will define um, will define some of these rotor dynamics. So, kind of yes. Now, I was just saying because I've seen in the cantilever design the horizontal uh, orientation is more susceptible to oscillation than the vertical one where you have symmetry. Yeah, yeah. And so, what, what that is, is that is an imbalance, is really what that is modeled as, right? You, you, there is this imbalance which can excite these modes. But it doesn't actually change what the traces are. But you, your test was it the motor? Yes. Was the test, are you going to be able to do a test. We can't actually do that. Right? But so we will, so the greater the imbalance, the greater the amplitude of uh, that it will excite. Now, the thing is, we need to stay away from all the amplitudes because we don't have the. Um, same back iron that a typical motor would, so we're staying away from all of them. So even if 
even if we are in this orientation versus this orientation. Does that make sense? OK. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that was the question. I didn't get the answer completely. Okay. Explain a little bit more. Okay. So if I test it in a horizontal plane. Yes. So really, what we're saying is that so these are the bearings, right? So these these two are the bearings, and this is the spring, which is setting the preload, right? In the two different positions, the preload on the bearings, right, in in both the radial direction and the axial direction will change. With those different preloads, that will affect where these are. Yes, but that's one of the reasons why we put, we put the string in, the spring in there to try and decrease how much that will change. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we tested this. This is the this is the map that we tested. Now, future work includes testing this. OK. Thank you, guys. Our next speaker is Fu, and he got his Bachelor of Electrical Engineering from the University of Minnesota in 2013 his Master's of Electrical Engineering from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign in 2016. He is working towards his PhD degree now. His research interest mostly lies in power systems, including applications of signal processing techniques and accessing impacts of distributed energy resources to the system dynamic stability. So uh, is there a clicker? Yeah, I, I will need to play the video uh, um, sometime. Yeah. Yeah. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you for being here today. Um, today, we'll talk about the impulse response estimation using ambient synchrophaser data. If the term is uh, like unfamiliar, it will be, become more and more familiar as I go on with my presentation. Um, so uh, the, the, course, the main course I'm bringing today is going to be a theorem. Then I will sketch the proof for that theorem. Uh, then I'll give some examples for that theorem. Uh, and then I will present an application of that theorem to the power system. Um, so let's first go with the, the motivation. Um, so uh, let's play with video and uh, try to see what what's going on. So this is about the start time of the event. The time is about, um, oh, sorry. I need to play it on. Yeah, it's not the same. Yeah. So let's play the video uh, to see what's going on. Uh, pay attention to uh, the map. Yeah, you see some kind of red color moving from. Florida up all the way to the north to uh, North Dakota. Uh, this is the uh, area of North Dakota. This is area of Massachusetts. And what this video is about is it a playback of an um, 2008 Florida blackout. Uh, some uh, bl an blackout happened in Florida, this area, and the color is displaying the frequency disturbance. So a disturbance in Florida will propagate across the eastern interconnected power system. Um, so what you have seen is the frequency propagation in large scale. And for sure, from video, we see that it has impact on the whole system footprint. And really, we want to study this phenomena. Of, there are some existing approach uh, to study the frequency disturbance propagation uh, using first is the model-based approach. Um, and the second is use post-event analysis. Um, but both approaches have limitation. Uh, what is the limitation of the model-based approach? So two 
perform the study using model-based approach, first of all, you need to have the model for all the components on your power system. Uh, second, you need to have the parameters for the model. And third, you, have, you need to have the topology for power system, uh, for the whole power system. But these information are kind of incorrect. Uh, you don't have it uh, precisely for the long period of time. So that is a major uh, disadvantage of the model base. The post-event analysis, so if you want to study prop uh, frequency disturbance propagation, you have to wait until a real event happens um, to, to do the study. So we are raising a question, is, um, is it possible to just use the frequency measurement on the power system during a normal operating condition uh, to predict the behavior of power system in an abnormal operating condition. Yeah, so use something from normal to predict something in an abnormal condition. So to do that, we look at, um, uh, there's some literature in exploratory. Yeah. There are um, some work in exploratory geophysics. Uh, what they did there is they cross-correlate the measurement at different locations on the Earth and they predict if a big uh, earthquake happened in one location, what would the effect uh, on the other location? Um, and uh, um, so that kind of effect, uh, that kind of estimation, they call the green function estimation, and that is closely related to the impulse response estimation in power system. Uh, one difference is on the, uh, for the Earth, people treat it as a continuum in a uh, continuum uh, model, but for power system, that is discrete because you have generated at different locations and they are connected by the transmission lines. So that is where the contribution of the work uh, going to. Uh, we proved that this cross correlation can recover the impulse response for a class of discrete system, and then we use the, this approach to study the frequency disturbance propagation um, across the, the power system. Um, so I have a theorem here. Uh, consider a linear system in the form. This is x dot. Think that this is a A matrix, uh, x plus B U. And the A matrix, this structure, that is the system of second order uh, oscillator. So each oscillator is in the form of M x double dot uh, plus uh, D x dot plus K x equal to uh, the applied force on that. Um, and to make it um, uh, theorem work, we need M to be a positive definite matrix, K only need to be a symmetric matrix, and gamma is a positive real constant. Um, and if you plug in here, the interpretation of gamma is the system is uniformly damped. So if you do, you have gamma, uh, you can have gamma to be a real positive constant, you can calculate the eigenvalue of this matrix, all of them will have the same real part, same negative real part. So that is uh, uh, what does it mean with the um, um, uniformly damped. So if you have this system and you have the input to be white noise, white noise meaning you have multiple channels of input. If you integrate, integrate the product of two different input over time, it's going to be zero. If you integrate the product of one input with itself and two of them are aligned in time and you take the average, it's going to be a constant. And if the product of two things uh, of the same thing but it shifted in time, you integrate that, that go back to zero. So that, that is what it means with the, the white noise assumption I made here. So if you have that condition, then this is, if you take the cross correlation of two states, it's going to be a constant multiplied by the impulse response. So this theorem gives you a way to estimate the impulse response by measuring the output, and you can calculate the cross correlation of the two output of the system, and then you will recover the impulse response. Um, so let's see. Um, I will make some more clear explanation here. So consider a system of an object, and each of them have second order oscillatory uh, dynamics. Um, so you will have n inputs, uh, you will have two n stakes. The way I arrange here, let's think about like the first n stakes correspond to the position, and the next 
end state correspond to the speed of the object. And, you apply, uh, and what we have is the white noise applied to the input. You measure the, out, the output. Let's say you have, you, you have output at the first speed and the second speed. And then you cross-correlate these two. What you will get is the impulse response from the U2 to the first speed. It will have this shape. Yep. Um, maybe you not believe me, um, but we already proved that this um, uh, this theorem is true. And um, to I will um, just talk about the sketch of proof here. So we need to prove that the impulse response is the same as uh, the cross correlation. So to prove something to be the same, we what we gonna do? We will write out the equation representation of the two. We look at what is uh, the same and what is kind of not the same, and we will show that the thing not not the same will be equivalent in some way. Um, so to do that, we choose to um, write out a solution in the model representation. In the model representation, it means that uh, we will apply a change of variable uh, z equal to s inverse x, where S is the right eigen vector matrix of the original uh, A matrix I referred to. And if you do, uh, why do we have to do the, um, um, this change of variable? Because af after we're doing that, we will transform the original dynamics into, a new, into the dynamic in the new variables that are uncoupled. So let's say uncoupled mean um, the Z1 dot equal only equal to a multiplied by z1. But in original system, you may have x1 dot equal to a multiplied by x1 plus b multiplied by x2. So by doing this transformation, you will get rid of um, that uh, dependencies. And the advantage of, of doing that is uh, we, we can analytically write out a solution uh, of x as a linear combination of the response uh, in uh, of z. So each exponential here will correspond to, to one z in a new um, in, in the in the transform variable. So um, if we have after having this one, we apply u to be the impulse input, and we get uh, what is the impulse response. And we also say that let's say u to be a random white noise input to be white noise input, input and we calculate a cross correlation, and this is what we get. So here's the impulse response in this form. And cross-correlation, it looks a little bit scary longer in this form. But the good thing is, let's see, we have SKI here and SKI there. They are the same. Exponential term, they are the same. So what we really need to do is to show the yellow term equal to the, a constant multiplied by a big thing in, in, the, in, the, in the blue box here. It looks a little bit scary because here you have a number and here you have a sum of two n numbers. But it turns out that if the system to be uniformly damped, this sum gonna be reduced to be only the sum of two terms. And we can show that the, the sum of that two terms equal to a constant multiplied by the yellow terms. And after going through that process, we know that the cross correlation is going to be a constant multiplied by the impulse response. Just so that is a sketch of proof. If you're interested, you can talk more to me. I will show you more detailed proof. And so the whole point of this theorem is doing cross correlation. So we are looking at a way to do cross correlation efficiently. Uh, so let's see. Uh, so now we, we lay out another problem is the computation of cross correlation. And for here, I choose to use FFT. Why do we use FFT? Because it have a fast term in, fast term in there. So I hope it's going to be fast. Um, but that is one reason. Another reason is because if we use FFT, given two sequence of data, we can use every single sample. Don't waste any sample in the data sequence to calculate cross-correlation. And the third reason is it's super convenient for me to implement on computer. Um, so let's see. Given two data sequence, x1 and x2, 
each of them have n samples. The requirement we want to have is we want the cross code correlation sequence to have n1 samples, and each sample of the cross correlation sequence is calculated from n2 samples of x1 and n2 sample of x2. So how would you do that? You can write a for loop, you can write n1 for loop uh, to calculate that, but I have a more elegant way uh, to do that. Just use fast Fourier transform. Um, so to do that, we need to define an extended sequence. The extended sequence x tilde 1, you make the first n1 sample of x1 to be 0. Um, you keep the n1, the last n1 sample of x1. Uh, this is n1 sample. You move it here. And you augment the, that sequence by n minus 1 zeros number. Uh, just follow me. It, it will be turned out very nice. Um, and then you make x2. x2, you need to flip the x2 sequence. So here, you have you, you given the data from left to right, but you have you put in the x2 sequence you put from right to left. And then you augment it by n minus 1, 0 numbers. The, and then what we, you do is you calculate the Fourier transform of the x tilde 1, Fourier transform of x tilde 2, you element-wise multiply these two, and you take the inverse Fourier transform. Then you have a sequence of x correlation. So what is the intuition behind that? If you have two sequences, you want to do convolution in time domain, that equivalent to do the multiplica multiplication in frequency domain, right? But cross-correlation is mean you convolve one sequence with the time reverse of the other sequence. So that's why in the x2, in x2 extended sequence, x2, we need to flip the x2 sequence. And then everything will follow. You uh, do convolution in time domain, it is the multiplication in frequency domain, and take the inverse. But one thing, because we augment it, um, the x correlation sequence have 2n minus 1 sample. So the next step is to determine which sample is useful and which sample is not so useful. Um, so it turned out that you only need to take the nth sample to the n plus nth one sample in the cross correlation sequence. And this, that will, will satisfy the original requirement. So each sample from here is calculated from n2 sample of x1 and n2 sample of x2. Yep. So uh, up to now, we have a theorem. We have a way to calculate a cross correlation. The natural next thing to persuade yourself that my work is valid is show some examples. OK, so let's go with a simple example. Um, let's consider the system M to be a 2 by 2 matrix. For sure, this is positively definite. K here is symmetric. And we consider the first gamma to be 0 for undamped system because it has some, something slightly different here. Um, and we calculate the impulse re response from U2 from second input to the third state. It have this form. And we calculate the cross correlation. Uh, it have this form. They look very similar. And to prove that they are exactly the scale version of each other, we, normal we normalize two of them and put them on top of each other. They are exactly aligned. So, and uh, from this, I want, just want to point out that uh, look at the scale here is 400. And in the next example, I use exactly M and K matrix, but I change gamma to 0.1. And I repeat exactly the same, but the scale here is only 0.04. So it has to be some, it, it, uh, if you're interested at all, I will explain in more detail, but I will just go fast. Uh, but I want to emphasize, uh, I think this is one contribution of uh, this work. Because in the literature, people haven't precisely um, identified what is the amplification, what is the amplification, amplification factor between cross correlation and the impulse response. But in this work, I show precisely what is that that constant. So now, because I work in power system, I need to make anything I work have some applications in power system. So here, um, the goal is. We try to estimate the frequency disturbance propagation speed, as I say, from the normal data and come uh, from normal operating condition. So what we have is, uh, uh, well, I should have put it in first. We have the 
Tiny OA Florida Blackout Playback video that I show at the beginning. And another thing we have is we have PMU frequency measurement uh, across the United States uh, during a very normal operating hour from 10 to 10, 15 a.m. Uh, in uh, January 20th, 2017, so not too far from here. So we tried to use the current data to predict something happened like 10 years ago, roughly 10 years ago. So how? For sure, cross-correlation. If I don't use that, I wouldn't spend like the past 15 minutes talking about cross-correlation. Um, but before we do that, let's think, why is it possible? The reason is for power system, we can model the generator dynamics using the swing equation. And the swing equation have this form. And for the large scale power system, uh, if you put all the swing equation into the state state representation, um, for large scale power system, all uh, the transmission lines are very close to purely inductive. That make, um, if you factorize it, this P matrix, you will have like, the K matrix to be symmetric or close to symmetric. So that satisfies the, the condition. And another uniformly damped come from the damping usually proportional to the inertia of the, of the rotor. So machine guys will be able to explain that better than I do, but I, that is a, the general thing we have. Um, and last thing here, what, what does it mean with the delta here? The delta is a rotor angle in synchronous reference frame. Uh, but what does the, PM, the PMU measure? The PMU measure the frequency, which is not equal to delta dot. It's equal to omega e plus delta dot, which is del omega e is the um, nominal frequency across the system. So how do we go from this data back to delta i? Uh, can we just subtract 60 hertz from that and um, well, for me, I, I don't really, people, even people say 60 hertz, but who knows, maybe, maybe 60.001 or something. So what we decided to do is just to apply a low pass filter to cut up the average value. So whatever data you put in, apply a low pass filter, um, and it will get rid of um, the, the average component. And the good thing about low pass filter is you need to design the cut up frequency and the length of the, of the filter so you have some more freedom to control um, the the the, uh, the output of your um, cross correlation result, and actually we apply that, um, and here is what I put out. Um, I list out the propagation time from a disturbance from Florida uh, to the uh, across the U.S. network. So if you're, uh, so if you look at this is the recorded time, and this is the time we use to estimate. Um, so we see that, let's look uh, at the uh, North Dakota. So if, a Flor if the um, Florida, uh, if something happened in Florida, it takes around 2.5 seconds uh, to propagate up to North Dakota. And 2.5 seconds here is what we see in, in the video, which is an actual thing happens. And by doing cross correlation, we could estimate the time is around 2.5 seconds as well. But we use the data like 10 years after that incident. And the data is from normal operating condition. So that is, I, I want to emphasize another thing. We use the normal operating condition data to estimate something happened if the system in abnormal condition. And yeah, so this, um, um, well, we, I just show some good points some from Massachusetts. It takes 2.6 seconds, and we estimate 2.4 seconds. Um, to somewhere here, I believe near Missouri, um, it takes 2.1 seconds, and we estimate to be 2 seconds. And here it is, uh, uh, we estimate to be 0.5 seconds, and actually happens to be 0.7 seconds. And so this graph concludes my uh, presentation. So in conclusion, um, we uh, proved that for a class of discrete system, uh, it, that system is second, the system of second order oscillator uniformly damped under white noise input, input condition. The cross correlation approach can recover the impulse response of the system. Uh, we show a convenient method uh, to calculate 
uh, the cross correlation using fast Fourier transform. And lastly, we apply the thing we have proved to power system we, and we accurately, we could accurately estimate the propagation time uh, of the frequency disturbance on the real power system. And uh, this concludes my thought. I want to say thank you to my advisor, Professor Hao Ju. Um, I want to um, um, say thank you to Professor Ad Ahmed Albana and uh, his graduate student Chen Li for their, also they advised me in doing this project. And also the undergrad student uh, Yan Pei Chen who did some uh, work uh, processing the real data. And my uh, financial support come from the Cebo Institute of Technology. And I'm open to question if anyone has a question. Uh, yes. So one question I had was, does this thing mean that in 10 years the grid didn't change because you discretize the point? So it depends on the network. Is it dependent on the network, first of all? Of generators, where the generators are, how the transmission lines are connected, and so on. Is this dependent? Is this analysis dependent on the network? So the re so the data we use doesn't depend on the on the network. We just take the measurements. So it doesn't. We don't really care what is the underlying network there. We take the measurements, and we do cross correlation, and we get out is the impulse response uh, from one location to another location. So I would say the network will determine how the re the impulse response looks like. But our method doesn't need information about the network. But isn't the propagation time dependent on how the network is connected? Say, for example, I have a very weak link between some points. Yeah. And suddenly, after five years, someone put another transmission line, and that is much bigger. And or some wind turbines came into the network, and that changed my entire network. Yeah. Does that not change my propagation time? It would change, and we will be able to capture that. So in the last 10 years, nothing changed. That's what it says. Like, since you can record that, yeah, let, something like it happened 10 years ago. Yeah, let's think the scale up power system we are considering is the entire US uh, network. And if you look at the increase in demand of the energy consumption in network, it kind of staggered in the past 10 years or so. So I would say the network hasn't been changed that much in the United States. Yeah. Well, what about renewables? Um, so here, so I would say the renew for now the the level of penetration of renewable is still low compared to the amount of energy you generally use in conventional generator. So I would say if we have more and more renewable energy, we would see lots of uh, maybe there's going to be change, uh, but for now I. I I still don't see the the huge impact of the reno, renewable just because the portion of energy they are generated is still small. Yeah. Um, yes. 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 Um, so your question is: Is the linear linearity assumption valid in this case? Yeah, normal condition. Um, typically, it is normal at 60 hertz, and you see 60.04. So that is, uh, it, if you look at a lot, like long time scale, it deviates around 60 hertz. It can go up to 60.04. Um, but if you look, and within, and at each instant of time, there is for sure some variation around, uh, an, an, like fast variation around a an, not. An, mm, and yes. The scenario we have, I 
we can go back. This is 16.15, so like four times bigger than the normal deviation. So it seems it, this model is quite linear. Right? Yes. So what does that mean? So it means that the operating point doesn't change like too much. I guess that is the the interpretation. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I think in order to uh, uh, to make this work, the we need to assume the linearity of the um, no, of the of the system, and indeed by this verification, we justify that that assumption is reasonable. Yeah. Um, yeah. I ha I haven't looking into uh, into that area yet, um, but I um, I remember uh, Professor Overby and T uh, T Su has some work on like virtual inertia. So if they put that work into reality and operate. Um, the solar farm, uh, like at a virtual synchronous generator, then this work gonna be still valid. So it comes um, to uh, the thing is how people really implement and how people integrate um, the renewable energy to the system. If they integrate it in a nice way, then it's, it's still nice, but they, if they don't pay too much attention into um, the dynamic behavior of the renewable energy, then we, going to be see something funny happen. So uh, any more question? One more question. Maybe anybody can answer it, not specifically. Yeah. Know this one. So for a typical synchronous machine, what happens to the control when such disturbance activates? It remains constant, like the core speed current remains constant for this kind of disturbance, or does it change? Does it react to this kind of water machine? Um, so it doesn't react. Uh, so look at the time scale we have here. It is around four or five seconds after the, uh, the disturbance. So the primary control of the generator will be kicked in but the sec uh, to stable the frequency. But the secondary control to bring the generator back uh, to bring the frequency to 60 hertz hasn't been activated yet. Yeah, so that is another thing we are looking right now. So we know that for a, uh, just a swing equation, it works very well. But now let's use higher order machine model with the primary control incorporated. Then how would it change this behavior? Yeah. Yep, so thank you, everyone. And I guess now is a pecky meeting, right? Okay, Roger, have a quick pecky meeting.